I'm, I'm Ray Belize, for those of you who don't know me, and this is Ben Goldstein. Uh, he's been my friend for what, something like five years, everything from uh, doing science to scuba diving. Um, things you should know about him. Uh, everything he does turns to gold. Um, starting out with uh, his, his undergraduate thesis, uh, which was in psychology, studying depression, he won awards for it. Uh, his uh, MPH work at Berkeley, at, um, at University of California, Berkeley, Cal, uh, was looking, uh, he did an MPH there, looking at false discovery rates, he won awards. Uh, then he went on to get his PhD in biostat, also from Berkeley, uh, looking at uh, using machine learning or statistical learning uh, to identify genes. Again, he's, he's been a superstar. Um, I knew him for, he was at Stanford for what, five years? Uh, three and a half years. Years at Stanford. Um, he had the reputation as of being one of the people who could speak both to doctors and to mathematicians. He can translate nicely. Um, he, his primary domains that he's worked in has been uh, in breast cancer, uh, studying hearts, uh, looking at uh, adverse events in dialysis and kidney failure. Um, what's really good about Ben is he can do both the classic epidemiology approaches as well as the computer intensive uh, high throughput. Um, he does everything. Ben. Wow, that's, that's a heck of an introduction. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, no, I, I'm, I'm really happy that Ray was able to, um, to, to invite me here. Um, and so a lot of the stuff I've been working on in the past few years has been um, moving into electronic health records. Um, and for those who are at ENAR the, this past few days, it's, um, it's definitely blowing up actually as an area. There were actually a ton of great talks about it, a lot of different people, really smart people thinking about a lot of issues around it. I'm kind of curious, um, so just to get a feel for the audience, um, how many folks here are students? So we have a few, okay, a good number of students. Um, and, and how about uh, clinicians? Okay, and, and, and the rest I imagine are staff, faculty. Okay, excellent. Okay, yeah, no, so, so this is, um, so I actually really enjoy this talk, actually. This is, um, of, you know, as you start doing more and more talks, you kind of develop a, a bag of them that you can pull out at any given time. And this is one that I really enjoy because, um, as Ray kind of alluded to in my background, I feel it really touches well on some of the statty stuff and kind of the, there's some methods, but it, 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 for me it has a very strong flavor of actually where I came from in um, more on the epidemiology side and not just simply how do we analyze data, but how do we think about data. Um, and um, for those who follow all the pop media, the big buzzwords these days is, is big data and big data is gonna cure all of our ills and whatnot. Um, and I, you know, it's, the, to me, what really, um, I, the more I started playing with these really large data sets, what I became convinced of is that the ability and strength around them isn't the ability to analyze 100 million records because you can, if you want to estimate some mean, you can do just as well with analyzing, uh, estimating on 100 people as you can on 100 million people. You're not going to improve that much. What really I found, uh, what I've discovered is the real value of large data sets is to be able to cherry pick who and what you want to analyze, that um, you're no longer constrained, you don't have to be constrained by saying these are the 1,000 samples we have and this is um, the, the limitations in the data, but you can actually use a really large data set to pick the 1,000 samples that, you c that best illustrate um, the question you're going after. Um, so, and that's what th this talk, I realize I'm in the middle of it, um, it will c illustrate, um, I'll walk through four so different problems that I've been working on over the past year. Some are finished off, some are still in the completion stage, um, around working with EHR data um, in the context of hemodialysis. Um, also, um, it's, for me, it's late in a week um, of a lot of meetings and stuff, so um, these talks always are more interesting for me, and I think the audience, too, the more interactive they become, so please interrupt, ask questions. Um, if I don't get through it, I, don't, I won't be sad, but I think, you know, there, but the extent to this can become a more discussion-oriented, I think, would be great also. Um, so, I love this quote actually, so it, it, it's amazing to me how old it is. Um, so I was given this paper when I first started at Stanford. And started, um, so it's from an NHLBI w w working group, and this has really motivated me to start working in this area. Um, so this paper from this group started talking about how the ability to forecast near-term risk of acute cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac death would represent an important advance in cardiovascular medicine because it clarify which individuals are in most urgent need of intervention. Essentially what the, what the working group was reacting to was, um, cardiology has done a great job in long-term risk prediction, things like the Framingham risk scores and then derivatives thereafter, um, the Reynolds risk and other scores that have improved upon it, um, have really changed cardiovascular clinical practice and the way both 
um, clinicians and patients think about their long-term cardiovascular health. And they were setting up as the next frontier. We now need to move away from thinking about 30 and 10 year risk, which things like the, uh, those metrics do really well on, and begin thinking about, well, what is one year risk? What is 30 day risk? What is 30 minute risk? And, and, I th and, they, start, and they propose this question, they start talking about what those studies may look like and what those data sets may entail. Um, and then and, and it ended with kind of a call to arms. And, and then what the, one of the bullet points at the end was the need to develop novel methods for data analysis, statistical and predictive modeling using multidimensional data sets. Um, I had recently just finished my PhD where I did a lot of work in genetic association studies. I was a little bit bored of working with SNPs, which anyone who's worked in genetics um, will tell you can only become so interesting because you're dealing with zeros, ones, and twos that don't change very much over time. Um, so I was excited about looking at, at some new data that would actually have some exciting structure. So um, kind of hearing a call for that, I um, said, oh, this sounds exciting. Let me start working on this problem. And, um, and as for those who are at ENAR, you'll, you would have noticed that I think a lot of other people, really, and m m very smart people, much smarter than myself, have also started to work on this problem too because I think it's something that is both fascinating from a methodological point of view, but also really from a clinical point of view. This is, you know, for statisticians, this is really our opportunity to feedback what we're doing in, in an immediate return in, into clinical care when you're when you start giving a prediction algorithm to a doctor and it's not about this is a patient's 10-year risk of heart disease but this patient is going to crash in the next 30 minutes try to do something about it that has a very acute feel to it and that's and while i won't talk specifically about that problem th those are the types of problems that um, we're starting to think about and, and work on um, so just a a brief outline. Um, I'll go through a little bit of background on end-stage renal disease and cardiovascular disease. So this work is all in the context of dialysis EHR data. Um, th there's a lot of strengths and advantages actually to working with dialysis patients, and I'll comment on some of that. Um, go through what, what the data actually are like. Um, and then I'll, I'll walk through, um, as time permits, um, these four different um, vignettes, if you will. Um, one is about a, a causal inference story. Another is, kind of, um, is a biomarker identification problem. Um, the third will be a classification problem. And the third will be a, a risk prediction problem. Okay, so for the, the non-clinicians in the room, um, this will be for you. And for the clinicians in the room, I ask you to cl close your ears, because I'm, I'm sure I'll butcher something. Um, but so hemodialysis is a process that, um, that folks have to go through when, when their kidneys no longer function anymore. Um, you, go to, um, in, you go typically to an outpatient center. You sit in one of these chairs. You get hooked up to these machines. And the machines serve as an, a, an external kidney. Blood circulates through the machines and it removes all um, re removes your blood out of your body and removes all wastes and all t toxins in the way that your kidneys should typically be doing. Um, it's a life necessity um, endeavor. If you didn't do this, you would die. So, that, um, so um, but if you do this, um, you will can have a, actually a decent l lifespan. Uh, so, um, so this is. This is typically done at a center. There are forms of dialysis that are done at home called peritoneal dialysis. I'm only going to focus on the in-center hemodialysis. Um, the, in the US, at least, it's most typical for this to be three times a week, though um, some places will do actually a six a week um, set sessions. Europe particularly will do it a little bit more often. Um, there's some evidence that doing it more often is better, but obviously it's a, a higher burden on the individual to go to these, go sit more often because these are about three to four hour sessions. So it's really changing your life um, that you have to program into your daily routine that you need to go to the center. Um, uh, and then, so not surprisingly, actually, a lot of these um, dialysis centers are not located at hospitals, though they sometimes are. They're actually located in place um, in, in downtown areas, maybe a shopping mall, uh, maybe a, 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 a a, a Main Street area because they're located in places where people can easily get to and access. Um, not surprisingly, this is a life-changing event. The only way you really get off of dialysis is with a kidney transplant. Um, kidney transplants are not easy to come by depending on where in the country you live. Um, your wait can be very long. And so the, and the median survival is about five years. So um, for, I, I, I liken it to a moderately aggressive cancer, essentially. Um, that, you know, th that's, that's what you're thinking about. These are folks who are not doing well. 
Um, there's very strong relationships between um, ESRD and cardiovascular disease. Um, some of the, the nephrologists I work with, um, they, they think of it as really one disease in the same um, that, that will maybe manifest itself differently. About 50% of all cause mortality is due to cardiovascular disease, 25, um, half of which is due to sudden cardiac arrest. Um, and not surprisingly, there's been a lot studied about, ESR, about um, CVD in this population. Um, there's things that are known that are risk factors that are not controllable, like your age, your diabetes status, and things are actually a little bit more controllable, actually, through the dialysis process. Um, your serum potassium, which is controllable, um, the, your ether-stimulating um, agent that you're receiving, uh, the ultrafiltration volume. Um, so the, the point I really want to make here is that from an epidemiological perspective, there's a lot known. We're, we're, and, and the goal now is, at least the goal that I see it, while, while the full epidemiology is known, the, the full causal story is still being flushed out in certain respects, um, what I see the goal now is moving away from just simply saying, what are risk factors, but let's now do something about it. Let's, now, how can we use this knowledge about, uh, about the fact that high serum potassium is a risk factor and actually use this to push the, our knowledge base further, particularly from a, a risk prediction or risk assessment perspective? Um, so, Studying ESRD is actually a really interesting and exciting thing um, in a disease um, compared to a lot of other US uh, diseases um, among US populations. And the reason for that is that when the, um, the dialysis machine beca um, became uh, invented, was, was made re usable, it was recognized that this, it was essentially a binary life or death tool. And as such, it was r r recognized that anyone who needed it should have access to it. Um, it's interesting to, th um, to think about, if you think about the, the politics around um, healthcare today, um, this, was, um, this was made in 1972, so signed under a Republican president, um, Richard Nixon, that this should be, that all folks who have ESRD, regardless of age or income status, are eligible for Medicare. Um, and they were, because it was deemed that, the, well, why wouldn't the government fund these services because it meant life for these people. Um, as such, we essentially have a population, a full population capture of folks on receiving the dialysis services. Um, cancer, I think, is starting to get there with, with, with registries like SRTR, uh, but it's not nearly the amount of information than, than what you have currently on dialysis patients because what, because, what, what we have is a single payer system for all dialysis services, which means that if anyone who's worked with claims data, for example, you can observe all the medical um, procedures and diagnoses that any individual who's receiving dialysis services goes through because that they're all available and through me Medicare claims. And, and anyone can actually re request these data, begin to work with these data. Um, they're now housed at University of Michigan. They're actually freely available. And it's, a and, and it's one of the reasons why there's actually so much known about the epidemiology of, of ESRD is because there's this tremendous data resource that simply doesn't exist with other diseases. Um, you don't have this in cardiovascular disease. We have to rely on large cohort studies like, like the Framingham or ERA cohorts to develop this knowledge. Here we essentially get this for free in a sense because the data are just naturally collected. Um, the, so while this is great from an epidemiological perspective, for the, um, again, those who have worked with claims data, um, what you're also aware is that there's, there are strong l limitations to it. Um, and what it really lacks is information on the day-to-day -day experience. So most of the work that we do with, uh, w w with the USRDS and the claims data um, are very much focused around um, long-term trends or, or, or looking at um, which comorbidity maybe um, comes before another comorbidity, but you can't get a full causal story. And, and, you and, what you, and what you can't get at is you can't get at the strong temporality that you may really want when you start talking about risk in, 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 over sh shorter time periods. Maybe you can come up with a good metric for five-year risk of, of mortality, but if you want to come up with something of around 30-day risk, that's going to be much harder with these data. Um, so this is where the use of electronic health records really comes in. Um, there's lots of it. it Ad advantages and there's some unique advantage aspects that are particularly unique to dialysis data. Um, so I'm not going to talk about um, the EHR data as as you may collect um, from University of Miami Medical Center or where I'm at D Duke Medical Center, which is actually not going to have a lot of these strengths associated with it. So that, so I want to highlight actually what those strengths are. So. Like, so like all EHRs, you have what you'd expect, the patient information, laboratory measures, medications, um, treatment-specific factors. That's basically going to be into varying quality any EHR. Um, 
I can, you know, it, it, you, you can ask someone like Ray about what, what that quality looks like. But, but, but in, in principle, Epic in any system is going to collect that type of information. Um, and to an extent, what, you're going to, what that means is you can get information on a patient's evolving health status. You can see as they're changing. What becomes very unique about the dialysis setting is that these folks are receiving services every other day for months and years at a time. So in a typical EHR that's attached to a medical center, there is what I like to call informative presence. You only see a, a patient when they're sick, when, when they're not feeling well. You don't have this problem in dealing with, with dialysis data. Every, every other day, the, in principle, the patient is there. You see what their blood pressure is. Every month, you see what their labs are. You see how much weight was taken off. And, this, and, and, and some of the stuff I'm going to show is, is really meant to exploit that clean longitudinal information and perspective that you, you, you get on patients. Uh, so, and so, in, in, so in some ways, some of this work is, this is almost, I, I'd call this work a best case scenario for working with, with the HR data, and, and it's been a great f source of data to start working with, to start thinking about these problems. As some, more of my stuff is moving over towards medical center data, the, the question now is to what extent can we e easily transfer? And I think there is room for transferability, and um, we can talk about some of that at a later point, but we'll see. Um, the, the, the challenges are that at the end of the day, the, um, that these are outpatient data. So you do have, as with all EHR systems, if somebody goes and gets s services at another clinic or needs to get hospitalized, you're not going to see that information. So there is that potential f for, m for missing data. Um, and as I like to say with all ops, and, this, and at the end of the day, this is observational data. Um, you can never forget that. So what you see is what you get. I love working with observational data. I think there's a lot of fun things you can do with it. But what you, need to, what you always need to remember is, uh, are the limitations that exist around it. Okay. So what do these data actually lo look like? Um, so, the se so these come from DaVita Incorporated. It, um, for the, is this a DaVita area? D does DaVita exist? In, in, okay, yeah. yeah, so DaVita is, is that, so it's a national dialysis chain. It's the second largest for-profit dialysis chain in the country. Um, it tends to be highly located in, in, in the southeast. Um, so North, so um, Raleigh Durham area where I am, where I am is, is also a, a DaVita area. Um, they'll also, um, um, the Bay Area is also a, a, a DaVita area, too. Um, there's about 1,400 facilities nationwide. We have all of their EHR data from 2006 through 11, um, patients of all ages. Um, so there's about 44,000 new patients that, that enter um, the data set essentially each year. Um, each year is about 160,000 unique patients. Each patient, on average, because again, they're coming every other day, has about 100 dialysis sessions a year, so it's about 16 million dialysis sessions. So over the, the full data set, if I wanted to analyze if I wanted to analyze on a dialysis session by session level, there's over 100 million um, dialysis sessions to analyze. I would never argue or suggest or even think about doing that. Um, to, it, it doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to take, because you're not it, to take all that information and try and make sense of it all at, at one time. And what, and, and what the focus of this talk will really be about is which of these 100 million sessions at any given time do we want to focus on? We're not going to look at all of them, so which ones do we care about? Um, because, that, because not only do we have a very long data set of a lot of, a lot of observations, we have a lot of information also about each session. Um, we, have, um, we have your typical um, demographics. We have um, lots of laboratory measures. Uh, there's about, I think, 20, 25 labs that, are, that exist in about at least 90% of people. Um, and then, and, and, so these are labs that are collected regularly. And then there's an extra sets of labs that um, maybe if someone's on um, a morphine, you would have uh, INRs on them. So uh, other labs that are specific to maybe a certain subcondition. Um, we, you, we have information on what types of d dialysis me medications, what, what the doses are at each session. We have um, dialysis specific factors, the day of the week, how long it went for, how much weight was taken off, information that's collected um, before and after the session. And then, we, and then some of the, what, I th what really got me in, interested in these data um, are the hemodynamics, which are essentially available in real time. Um, well, so, so we have them about 
f 15 to 30 minute increments during a dialysis session. Um, some of the um, newer data that I'm starting to, to play with now out of um, the Duke HR is actually in, in, in information of this nature, but available on, on a second by second basis. But what really got me excited about starting to move into the HR space is thinking about what can we do with streaming data, information that's coming in. It's something that our colleagues in either finance or online advertising have done a lot of really interesting work with, but as medical health researchers, um, be partially because of access and, and partially for, I think, for cultural reasons, we haven't done enough really thinking about this type of information. But, uh, but like I said, it, there's, I think there's more and more people now who are starting to, to think about these questions and how do we w handle th this type of dense information. Okay, so you know, is there any questions about this background? Okay, okay so, so jumping into it. Um, so the first question um, that came up that we, um, it's actually one of the first questions we started working with on this data set um, was, and this is almost more of a, a question that we want to get, start getting a feel for these data. And the que um, so the question that, we, that one of the fellows I was working with asked was interested in, um, does the administration of heparin decrease the risk of death? I'm gonna go on this side so I can actually see the. Okay. Um, d d does the administration of heparin um, increase the risk of death? Um, heparin is a drug, it's a blood thinner that is given, that's a blood thinner, right? Yeah, okay. Um, it, it, it's a blood thinner that's typically given during a dialysis session. Um, how, um, and so there's a typical question that one may consider, is that good or not to give? Um, the problem is that there's a lot of confounding by indication. Basically, um, if you are too, it, 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 those who receive heparin are typically healthier. If you're too sick and to, to be given this drug, um, then you're just not gonna receive it. And so it, there's usually the, this hidden indication that you're receiving the drug, that there's something else already different about you. So this is a very typical causal inference type of question. We have observational data, we have, we have um, a strong indication for, for, for confounding. What's gonna be the best way to, to analyze these data so that we can best answer, and, my, and, and what I wanna emphasize, not even best answer, but convincingly answer this question. So when people talk about causal inference, um, and I'll say this with the caveat that um, at the end of the day, I'm actually not a causal inference person um, in the same way that some of my colleagues are. But what I, what I really think about someone coming with a causal inference question is you want to, the goal is to move beyond making statements of association. It's, you know, we, we can all run a regression. We can all say that, you know, here is the, the estimated uh, association and then he, here's all the caveats w w with that approach. And, 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 and that's responsible, but the, but, but there's enough work in a lot of different areas that have established perhaps a relationship. The goal when you, when you start talking about causal inference is how can we move beyond those limitations? How can we think beyond the, the, the limitations that maybe a typical re regression model is going to present and make a statement that's more convincing? And, I'll, and, I'll, and you'll see when, once I show the results why I'm making that emphasis at the beginning. Um, so the approach we took was was using propensity scores. We could have used um, what are called um, we could have used a weighting approach, something like um, marginal structural models. Um, we even could have used a actually um, there was potential to use an instrumental variable approach using something like facility as an IV. Um, but we used pr pr propensity scores here, um, and I actually really like propensity scores, and because what, what I love about them is they. Coming again, coming back from my epidemiological perspective, they force you to think about what is the population of interest that you're comfortable making inference upon, and you'll see what I mean by that. But just to define what they are, um, so propensity score is a single variable th that represents the known confounding factors, and the emphasis is on known here because this is not a way to control for something that's unmeasured. It's a way of saying I know that, th that these pieces of information um, um, are confounders of both my treatment and outcome relationship, um, maybe presenting some bias um, in, in my estimates, and I want to efficiently summarize that information. Um, we can define the propensity score as the probability of our treatments given our confounders and as, and, as just simply a function of our confounders. We're, and, 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 this, and the key also is that we're, we don't need to necessarily l limit ourselves to any form of this function. We're just saying we want to map our confounders into some probability of, of receiving the treatment here. And like most causal inference approaches, the goal um, th that we're going after is to, tr is to try and emulate a, a randomized clinical trial. And, and I'll show how this is achieved. 
Um, so f can be any function. It's often typical for it to be a logistic regression um, function. Um, and there's actually a good reason for that. There's, there's been some really interesting work that's shown um, that even though logistic regression may not be the best estimate of f, um, because of its smoothness, it actually does better than if you were to do a really good job estimating f, you could actually run into problems. So actually doing a very sophisticated machine le learning approach and, and getting a great estimate of, of this probability is not always to, to your advantage. Um, and, and, the, and these propensity scores actually can be used in multiple ways. People just hear propensity score and, and they think m matching. Um, but the propensity score is actually what's used when, when you're doing something like a marginal structural model. You're actually using this propensity score. We are using it um, to create an, an inverse probability of treatment weight. Um, but we're going to use it here um, to, to create matched pairs. Um, so I promised I'd talk about um, that a theme of this talk was cutting down data. And, and, I'll, and, and this is exactly how we did this here. And I'll show how we went from 75,000 people to um, about 1,400 people and why this was r rational. Um, so we looked at data. Um, we looked at folks who were in the EHR um, between uh, just in, in 2007 to, um, through 2008, so just a two-year block. There are about 75,000 unique people. Um, then we looked at individuals who were newly diagnosed. So you can already get the flavor of what we're doing here. We're trying to define a cleaner cohort. So we don't want just all people, but we want people who are, who are newly diagnosed. Um, now we want people who had a session um, on day 90. So, not, so we want people not only who are diagnosed, but we want to look at them all at the exact same time period. We want to say that they've all been, that, that there's something beginning to become comparable about them. They've all, and, and they all were healthy enough to be alive on day 90 to go to, to a, a day 90 session. They're not already perhaps in the hospital, for example. Um, because um, warfarin is, the, the use of uh, uh, warfarin is such a, ca a counter indicator for, um, for, for receiving um, heparin. Um, we, we want to take out people who didn't have any history of warfarin use. Um, that's not too many people. Um, and, and now we're left with, um, and now we're left with the beginning of our analytic cohort. We have 836 people who received heparin, 11,000 people who did not receive heparin. And the typical approach at this point would be to take this, um, this data set of about 12,000 people and run a adjusted um, logistic regression throw all you you, you have more than but events here you could um, if you want to go by something what's the what's the rule you know um, the 10 to, the, the 10 uh, events for every predictor rule you can throw a, a, a you know, your, your intro stat books will tell you you can throw 83 covariates in the model. Um, you, can, you can fit that. You can estimate it. You probably get good standard errors even. Um, but you'd be left with a very uninterpretable model that would ultimately be, you'd have to say at the end of the day, um, these are the caveats of this approach. So what, and, and so what we'll show is what actually, what we can get by doing some, some matching at this point. Um, so we matched individuals based on all the covariates, and we'll sh I'll show you them. And we end up with a, that almost all the people who received the drug um, were able to find a match. About 100 just didn't have a good matching. Um, and, and we end up dropping down a lot. And we end up throwing out a lot of people who ended up did not receiving the drug, but we're saying that they're not of interest anymore. And we'll see why they're not of interest. So, um, so, so here's our list of all of our different baseline confounders. Um, the, um, a typical way to look at these are, are, are by standardized differences. Um, the greens are, are before matching. We see a lot of things are out of balance. I'm sure that the clinicians aren't going to be surprised to see that there's that among the people who receive heparin and don't, that there's big differences in things like systolic blood pressure. There's big differences um, in hemoglobin, in, in, in platelet count, in albumin. That these are just different patients. You're, 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 you're essentially making an apples to oranges comparison between two groups. Once we cut down our data and now we matched, things are actually looking pretty tight. Um, the rule of thumb is a standardized um, difference of 10. I, um, I don't think there's any real theoretical behind it. I think it's just the rule of thumb people use. Um, again, we see by other things, you know, it, everything is, is looking in balance. And for folks who have worked in clinical trials, this is, this is your table one. This is what you want. You want to have two groups of individuals who look identical with respect to their baseline factors and only differ in the fact that they received a, one treatment or another. We're beginning to, to, to get that flavor that maybe we're going to believe a little bit more what our result comes out. Um, so let's get to the, the point here. What is the result? Um, so if we just analyzed the full cohort unadjusted, um, we'd end up with a um, d d um, a, a hazard ratio of um, uh, 1.41, suggesting that there is um, 
a big difference in terms of survival. People who are not taking heparin, um, it, that it's good to take heparin. People who are not taking heparin are dying faster. We know already this is, um, that we need to be adjusting here. This is to illustrate the potential for, um, uh, for, for confounding. If we, if we did a fully adjusted model of the, the full cohort, um, we essentially get n no effect. And if we do our propensity match, we get no effect. So I went through a lot of effort, spent a lot of time to say that you can get the exact same answer. So what's the value? Why did I waste my time? Or why did I even use this as an example? Why didn't I find a better example where I get different inference? What is the middle row? What, what is that? Oh, so this is using the unmatched. So you're using all 12,000 people, but, but, but doing a fully adjusted model. Meaning throwing all the covariates? Throwing all the covariates in, yeah. Doing Cox model, throwing all the covariates in what you would typically do in your association analysis. I actually prefer this result um, for, for illustrative purposes. It doesn't maybe, you know, maybe it's not as exciting in a journal paper, journal paper, but for an illustrative purpose, what I really like about this is that what I would ask yourself is, if you only saw one of these results, which one are you more inclined to believe? Are you more inclined to believe that fully adjusted model where you have that long list of limitations in your discussion, or are you more inclined to, to, to believe this matched data set where now we're, we're, we're creating maybe an, an artificial population, one that we have a better understanding about th that, the, that the two groups are comparable. We're comparing two groups of people who had equal probability of receiving the drug. And we end up with very similar inference. We, we end up with the notion that the drug, um, it doesn't really matter too much whether you receive the drug, but we maybe have a little bit more faith in that result. Yep. Next story, identifying biomarkers. Oh, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. to, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You can have two people with the same propensity score, mm -hmm. and they may be that different in relation to the variables that change during the propensity score knowledge. Yes, absolutely. So, the, so, so that's actually a really important point about propensity scores. The goal of a propensity score is not to match two, it, 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 you're not trying to find an individual's perfect match. So I don't want to find the, the an identical person to me, that who, but who just didn't get the drug. What you're, and what you're going for is, you're going for the table one. You're going for a balance on average, so, so what we call the, the, the marginal balance. So even though on, on an individual matching basis, you may be matching a, a man to a woman, someone with high hemoglobin to low hemoglobin, what you're going for is that across the, the entire data set, on average, you have an equal number of men and equal number of, of, of women. Yeah, so all you are trying to do is to have the Because mm -hmm. actually, I like your middle row mm -hmm. because the middle row, you didn't just throw anybody, you didn't select anybody, mm -hmm. and you were just for all the covariates, and you have a condition, suppose yep. size was big enough in the, the small group to adjust for all the covariates. The problem with the middle row, and, and, and I probably should have. And I probably should, I'm, I'm trying yeah. to understand yeah. because yeah. I see you are inclined to say I, I, yeah. that the propensity scoreboard would be the best. Mm -hmm. I just want to understand why. Okay, no, absolutely. And, and, I, and I should actually have a graph in here to illustrate. So the problem with the middle row is that there's people in that, in, in that analysis who have no probability, who have no chance of getting heparin. They are just too sick, and a doctor would never give them the drug. They'd look at that patient and say, I'm not going to give them the drug. I, I can't. When we're talking, so in the causal inference framework, what we often think about is what's the counterfactual? The counterfactual being, what would be, we observe someone getting the treatment, the counterfactual is, a, is what would happen to that person if, if I didn't give them the treatment. But for some people, that counterfactual doesn't exist. They have no chance of ever getting the drug. So why do I want to draw inference on them? Why do I want to in, 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 analyze those people? Why do I want to ask the question, what would it look like if they gave the drug? Because I know that no doctor would give them the drug. Similarly, the, um, among the heparin users, there are some people who, ha who are always going to get the drug for whatever reason. You know, just because there was so much indication that they needed it, they were going to give it. So it doesn't. So, so when we start thinking from that clinical perspective, because ultimately what we do as statisticians, or particularly as biostatisticians, we wanted to have some clinical relevance. We want to make sure that the, that the folks that we're talking about, that we're analyzing, have have meaning to, to, to those who are making clinical decisions. So, so that's. Why there's, so, so that's why there's value to this, is because we're removing those individuals who we don't want to make inference about anyway. How are you removing? That's what I don't see. How am I removing? So, so, so I'm removing in this process. So, I'm, so what I'm, so, 
so what you're fitting is, so when you fit this model, you, you get a probability for each person getting a treatment. So, you, so maybe I had a 25% probability of getting a treatment. Somebody, Ray, had a 95% probability of getting the heparin. Um, Sunil had a 2% a, a probability of, of getting heparin. And you're finding, and you're in the matches, for me, I want to find somebody else who also had a 25% probability of getting the treatment. But they didn't. So, and, and for Ray, I want to find somebody else who, ha who had a 75% probability of getting the treatment, but that didn't. But for Sunil, maybe I can't find that person who had only a 2% probability of getting treatment, but did it because, it, because it's so rare for someone with, with that set of co co covariates to actually get it. So, so that's the matching process. And, and I apologize, I should have been more clear on that. Well, we're, we're, yes? Oh, I got it. OK. So if you, I mean, I haven't really thought about this, but if, if you look at the ranges of your x vector across the two conditions, mm -hmm. and, they, and they overlap, mm -hmm. Well, so in because because you're using the argument that some people basically have contraindications mm -hmm. because there something about their yep. X's put them out of range. Yeah, you have a pen or no? Okay, so it, so if it, so if I had a marker, what I would do is so I, I I would draw exactly that. So what you often look at are the distribution of the predicted probabilities for the two groups. So what you may see is. Something like, and, and, and then you, and, 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 exactly, and, 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 and exactly, and, and you're looking, and you're looking at that overlap. So, but, but I, I think I, see, I hear what you're saying, though. We, in some yeah, ways, I'm just yeah. If you, if you were wedded you. to the to the control right version, one yeah. of the things you, you potentially could do is make sure that all your x distributions were similar across the two groups. Okay, I hear you. So, so doing so, know, yeah. I'm, so, so I. So I want to think about that. So in, so in some respects, we do that, right? So we, for example, remove anybody with warfarin. But I'm trying to think, but to explicitly remove, for example, so my sense is you have to be careful with that approach. Um, so Maybe. that you, you, know, you may want to think, you, you can think of it. So I, I like to think of all these questions like a trial. Um, what would I do if I were doing this prospectively? So you may think of ha as having inclusion exclusion criteria. Maybe our trial for heparin would, ha would have an ex inclusion criteria around warfarin use. And maybe we'd have um, a, a limitation range on saying only look at p folks between the ages of 55 and 65, for example. Um, so if you have good hard reasons around that, um, I can see where that would work. Um, to do that overly empirically, um, I'd be a little bit more concerned. Um, I don't have a good reason why, but but it's but but, but I think that that would concern me. But so it's and, and, but in, in in essence, that is actually what you're getting at by doing the, by doing the exclusion on the matching. And what you can and if you really want to understand who you're excluding out, you can then begin to look at what what is that table one of those folks who were removed. What what do their characteristics look like? And and particularly as they're removing back to that clinical question, that's what a lot of people will do. They'll look at that table one of the removed individuals. And like I said, I'm perfectly happy if I don't get through e e even half of this. So I'd much rather have a, an interesting conversation about w w one or two things than, so yeah. OK, um, identifying biomarkers. So the question here was, um, can changes in, in laboratory measures indicate in, in, in impeding myocardial infarction? Um, and the goal and the challenge is, well, how do we identify a clinically meaningful changes in, in, in laboratory m measures? Um, and I'll describe that in a moment. Um, so the approach that I took. Um, was um, using cubic splines with direct assessment of different parameterizations. And I'll explain what I'm meaning here. Um, so again, this will have a sampling flavor to it. So we're going to now look at a different cut of the data, a different type of data. Um, so the, what we, I started here was I selected all people without a history of MI prior to initializing dialysis. Um, the goal was that we want, I wanted to get a clean look at data. I wanted to take people who are essentially having their first MI, a myocardial infarction. Um, and the sampling approach of the data I, uh, took what's Typically, um, we talked about in epidemiology um, as, as a nested case control sample. Um, it's, I, I find it to be actually a really useful analytic tool with, when you're doing retrospective analyses that unfortunately isn't always familiar enough to, 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 to a lot of statisticians. I think, you know, so, so I think having a, a good handle on study design and, and, and some of these epidemiological epidemiological methods become really important the more and more you start working with these large observational data sets. So the way this works um, is that you, as in all case control studies, defining the cases is the easy part. So the cases are all patients that had um, a cardiac event, an MI, um, while they were an active patient. Um, and as with all case control studies, the hard part is defining who that comparative group is. Um, and here the comparative group 
um, was that we w w was that for each case we selected one active DaVita patient who was active at the time that they received um, th th that that patient had their MI. So there's a, a, a couple of different things that, that happen in that definition. One, so it, one it, it is that an individual can potentially serve as a control at one point. Maybe in 2006, they're chugging along, they're doing fine, they get randomly selected as a, as a control. And then in 2008, they later ha actually have their own event. This is completely allowed and in fact is, is, an, is a necessity for, uh, for, for you to, to allow that to occur so you don't have bias sampling. Similarly, someone can, can serve as a control m more than once. Again, the, these are aspects of the design that, it, that you can show are, are, are necessary components. And, and to think, and, and this is something that often troubles people, what, how can you have somebody serving as a case in a control at the same time? Again, I, I challenge, think back to how would you design this study prospectively? If you wanted to, and, and, and the way that I would do this analysis pr prospectively, if I wanted to look at how some laboratory's markers changed before the, in, an impending event, I would say, here, an individual d d just had an MI. I'm going to select somebody to compare them to who hasn't had an MI yet. Two weeks later, a new person has an MI. I'm going to select a new person to compare them to. When I make that initial selection of that comparative, I have no idea if they're going to have an MI two weeks from now, two years from now. I, can't, it, 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 I'd be, I, I don't know that future information. I can't condition on that future. So, if you, so, I, when you're, so I would say, whenever you're thinking about how do I select my data to, from a retrospective study, Think about how you would handle this if you were designing this prospectively, and the, the answers tend to pop out. What is the nesting? So the nested it. So the idea that so the reason that this is called a, a, a nested case control is that it's you have a you have a cohort in time that's going forward. The cohort is essentially the EHR. So yeah. In a exactly. Yeah. So the right. So the so the idea. So the notion is that we're reviewing the EHR as the cohort. Mm -hmm. Or a new independent case? Mm -hmm. or, yep. case or you, or you rely some, somehow? Um, so, we, so we treat it as an independent case. Um, we looked at it. What, what, what would be the implications of, of looking at some of the dependence? Um, the ratio of, of that in, in practice, because you're dealing with a rare event, is actually relatively low. So, 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 so whether you, you acknowledge that correlation does have impact. Yeah. OK, so but before showing the analysis, I, I, for this part, I like showing actually the results first. So what are the results? So the results are, here's albumin. This is time zero. So this is your index date when a, a myocardial infarction occurs. Um, the red are people who are just, are, are not, and this is going back 180 days, six months, and abstracting out the al albumin values. People who don't have an MI, their albumins are relatively flat over the time period. Folks who have an MI, we see that about 30 days beforehand, their albumin begins to drop. To any clinician, this won't be surprising. Albumin is an indicator of general overall health and nutrition. And it, so it's not shocking that before, it, before someone has something like a myocardial infarction, some of these markers are trying to change. But the goal here, again, we're not going after epidemiology here. We're not trying to identify risk factors. We're, we're trying to work towards an ultimate prediction model. And this is an indicator of saying, well, if I can observe changes in albumin on an, indiv on an individual, this may become an indication that this can be a marker for, for something bad about to happen. Um, and, and, on the, and the below line is actually just uh, the, the, the difference between the two curves. Um, another one, um, here we have white blood cell count. Um, and it, now we see white blood cell count is going up about 30 days beforehand. This is, um, to the clinicians I worked with, they found this one a little bit more interesting, um, partially because, so white blood cell count is associated with inflation and, and in an infection, it's been well documented that after an MI, that your white blood cell count will spike. And it's actually one of the ways that a, a more silent MI is diagnosed. But to see that it's actually spiking before the event, um, may, you know, among some of the clinicians I've worked with, raised maybe a hypothesis it, is there maybe an infection going on, and then that infection is what's in, in, inciting the MI. Um, versus what's not interesting. Um, here's platelet count. Really, we don't see any distinction. You, maybe you can argue there's something changing a little bit. But, but, but this would be an example of a non-clinically meaningful, not something that um, can be indicated. And, and more what I'd, I'd even say is what, uh, what some of my vision is as we start thinking about how do we use our tools and reintegrate them into clinical practice, well, maybe this becomes an indication that um, instead of just re re relaying out, for example, what a patient's white blood cell count is, what if we, sh showed, a, we showed a doctor, say, a patient's last six months of, of white blood cell counts and just, and, and just showed the curve of change? This indicates, well, we maybe want to do that for white blood cell count, but, but to do that for platelets isn't going to be very meaningful. 
Okay. Um, so for the clinicians, I apologize. This becomes this will be a little bit more mathy this part. Um, so with, quick, yeah. So what about things that we know about that are related to the onset of an MI? So some of the cardiac enzymes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right, yeah. Is that something that you're so, the, so that information is not regularly co co collected, so we, we don't have that. And even more so, I, I, and I'd say even more so that when, when, I, when I show the model that actually fit this, I'm specifically uninterested in getting this relationship right. And what I mean by that is I'm not, I'm not very interested in creating an adjusted type of model. Because when you're thinking about something as a biomarker, you're not actually trying to estimate what is the the, the, the real association between that marker and the outcome, what you're really trying to, what you're really asking the question is, well, what's that, well, you're more interested in, in, in that marginal association. How does that, a change in that marker show something about the, the potential for an outcome? So we're, we're so, so there's no causal story here. That, there's no, there, there, I'm not in any way saying that albumin is causing an MI. I'm not even saying that white blood cell is causing an MI. I'm just saying there's very likely some other third thing going on that's, that's changing both. But the goal is that we, we actually want that non-causal marginal relationship to, to serve as that indicator. Okay. Um, so, so, this is, so this is the model for how I actually um, fit these pretty curves. Um, I've purposefully put x on the left-hand side, and I'll explain why in a moment. But we have x is a vector of l laboratory measures um, indexed for person i, and they have and they'll have multiple ones over time. Over time, so at time t, so we so each row in, in, in our data is essentially a, a time point for an individual in their laboratory measure. Um, we're going to have multiple laboratory measures per person, so we're going to fit a random effects model and have a random intercept per person. Um, well, s here is a um, what we're, our goal here is that we're going to want to, to, to fit these curves. We're going to want, want to fit the, these changes in laboratory measures um, by some smooth function. We don't want to just fit a, necessarily a linear model around them. We want them to change over time. So we're going to do that b b by fitting splines. Um, SI is our spline basis matrix with um, parameter vector omega. We have our indicator here. Why is our indicator for whether a person had a myocardial infarction? And this is the reason why I like actually putting x on the left and y on the right. It's that reminder that these are retrospective models. This, this is not a predictive model at this point. We are conditioning, we are to fit this, to, to discover something, we're conditioning on who had the event or not. So I'm saying this, this, this is the group of people that had an MI. These are the group of people that did not have the MI. How do their curves differ? We're allowing this differ now to occur by creating an interaction, by creating an, placing an additional spline basis matrix for those that actually have the event. Um, and then here are some potentially um, time-changing covariates that we may want to condition. I just said we don't want to condition, but a, a few things that we may want to condition on just to get a little bit more understanding. Um, so our question of interest is going to be, are these, I can fit these curves, but our question is really, are these two curves d different? Is the red curve different than the blue curve? Um, so some may be having a little bit of insight of what's going on here, but we can actually now do a very simple likelihood ratio test for omega prime. That likelihood ratio test is asking the question, is, is omega prime adding anything to, to, to the fit of our model? And what this is indexing, it's, this is what's allowing the two curves to change. We're still allowing there to be maybe a shift. So it may be that people are about to have an MI are, are shifting, but we're, not, but we're less interested in maybe a shift indicator. But what we really want to discover is, is there a functional form difference? Is there a change different? And, that, and we can test that with, with omega prime. Um, we can all, and, but what I, what I love about this model is, and, and the more you start kind of, you know, you start thinking about, okay, what, what's your model really doing? The more you can realize, well, you can play with your model a little bit, and you can actually ask different types of questions. Uh, so we, so we can also ask the question, so we can fit this model just among those that, have, um, that don't have an event, the controls. And we may say that we actually want our controls to display linearity over time. Because as a biomarker, not only is it useful that the blue people are changing, it's, act, it's really important that those who are not going to event are stable, that we have a baseline. We could have. But there, there's also, there, so we can, we can do a likelihood ratio test just among these and say we want these to be linear. Let's say we're looking at folks over a 24-hour period, and there's a, maybe it was something like blood pressure that has a bit of a circadian rhythm. We can maybe 
posit that our null, our baseline, is something that, that will have s some type of s s cyclical relation. We don't have to constrain ourselves to, to being constant. And in fact, I, I constrained it not to being constant, but actually being just l linear, because some of the, some of the uh, labs do sh among the controls just show a, a linear change over time, and among the, the cases would show a, a, a departure f from that pure linearity. Um, and then we can actually, and then we can play with this a, a, a little more. Um, and, we, and I won't go to the details around it, but we can actually play with the, the not placements in our spline basis basis matrix to ask the question: When does this departure actually occur? Um, so what does this actually look like? Here's a series of some of the labs that, that we looked at. Um, here's and, and here are the ones that are showing the indications. Um, so for example, we see um, with albumin that the optimal um, departure. Um, is at about 28 days, um, and we can and we can play with this and and go forward. Okay. Um, what I would, what, what I do want to say. Uh, yeah. So would you validate this? Right. Some yeah. Test right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so why, why am I going the wrong way? Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. That's what I was looking for. What would a prospective uh, assessment look like? I, I, I planted the question. So we actually can. So we, so, so we can do a validation. The validation now, going back to the theme, it, is we need to use a different set of data. We can't use the same study design to actually validate. So, th so this was purely a discovery process. We want to look into the EHR. We want to figure out which are the labs that are meaningful to use. But now we want to actually validate how predictive are they, are they really. So this is going to need a prospective design. It's going to need a, um, a cohort design. Um, and what we can do is, I mean, we're starting this right now, is we're selecting individuals at the start of HD, following until the event. Um, and, 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 the, and the model that we're using now, we're using a very different type of model, um, what, what are called um, joint models, which allow you to have a, a, a changing set of coefficients over time. You can model, you typically you model as a spline, the changing biomarker, and then you, you put that into a, a Cox model or a time to event model to actually get that, pr that prediction. So that would be the validation part. This ends at three, correct? Okay. Um, I want to skip this one. I think it's a little bit less interesting. Okay. Um, this was a, a process of of uh, of using some of the um, the, the interdialect bl blood pressure data to, um, to classify people, but uh, I think this one had be a little bit, has a nice story at the end too. Um, okay. So this goal um, was: Can we predict near-term risk of sudden cardiac death? Um, this is your typical machine learning challenge. We have no a priori model. We don't know what the relationship is. We want to throw a lot of things together and just see how strong of a predictor can we come up with. Um, we're going to. Um, the goals are to show that sudden cardiac death can be widely um, can be reliably predicted in the near term. I'll define near term and illustrate that in EHR data can capture changes in acute risk. Um, so the outcome here was death due to sudden cardiac arrest on the day of or day after a session. So we're looking at 48-hour risk. And the reason is these folks in principle are touching the healthcare system every other day. So it's less important to know if, they're, if it's a Monday to know if they're going to die on Friday because I'm going to see them again on Wednesday. What I really want to know is, are they going to die before I see them again? That's, that's the proof of concept that we're going after here. I, I know on Wednesday I'm going to collect more information about you. So what I'm really focused on is, is something going to happen to you b before I have my next opportunity to see you? Um, and again, when you're working with, um, so this is a very rare event. There's about, this event happens about in one in 10,000 sessions. Um, that being said, in, in, because of the size of our data set, we had about w one or two events j just about every day of this nature. Is there a question? Oh, sorry. Okay. All right. Um, so quickly to jump through so, um, the, the approach, I think the results are a little bit more interesting. Um, we took a, a, a pretty similar um, nested case controlled design in terms of the sampling here, um, divided data um, over time in, into training and test data. Um, one thing that I like to illustrate with this is that size doesn't matter. Um, whether you did um, a, a one to one um, selection of cases and controls or you go all the way up to 10 to one, you get no better pr pr prediction. Um, this, for some folks, this may not be surprising. You can show that there's a, a, a limit on the, on the number of controls. But again, this is that illustration of why are you throwing out so much data? Well, because it doesn't help very much. It, it, you, there's really not very much gained but just by throwing non-information at the problem. But algorithm does matter. Um, again, um, so just if you look at a couple of different uh, uh, approaches, there is an advantage to using something like the lasso versus logistic regression. There is the, an advantage to using something like r r random forest um, versus cart. Um, these more algorithmic, maybe a little bit more b black boxy approaches, 
do add value, partic and particularly when you're less interested in fully understanding the model that you're building, but you just want to get those predictions, um, d d they do add benefit. OK, so, so just kind of jumping to the take home, what do we see? So if, if we fit a model just based on pre-dialysis information, patient walks into the clinic, is about to sit down, take all your information about you, throw it into um, a model, um, in this case it, it was random forest, how good of a, a prediction can I come up with for 48 hour mortality? W we can do pretty well. What's interesting and what's more exciting to me is three hours later, the session just ended. I've updated about 14 pieces of information. I know how your blood pressure changed. I know how long the session went for. I know how much weight was taken off. I can actually improve that. I can do a little bit better. I, I can get a meaningful improvement just by um, after that information. So there's something subtle that's being captured during the session that's helping predictability. And we'll see maybe what that may be. Um, another way of looking at this, if I take people who have, say, 10 consecutive s sessions, I look at their sessions over time, and I ask the question each time, are you going to die in 48 hours? And I, try to predi and, and I, and I apply my prediction model. Um, so these are people who are approaching their sudden cardiac death. They're, they're eventually going to have the event. At this time, the prediction for them is false. It, it, I'm, I'm, it, they're not actually going to die in 48 hours. They don't die in 48 hours until this point. But what's really interesting to me is that you really only begin to see the departure from, those, from the healthy folks about two to three se sessions beforehand, which is, again, a way of saying that there's something that's being updated and captured in the EHR that's changing, th that's changing the predictions. Um, another really interesting thing here. Let's say I, I, I try now to, so I, I train a different model and look at over different time horizons. I look at one day, I go all the way up to, to 365 days. What happens? Do I do better? We actually begin to do a lot worse. The quality of the predictions go down. And this is where, and, and, and this I think is something that, that it's really fascinating and makes you start thinking about, well, what are the data that I'm working with? And what I'm working with is I have a lot of lab data. I have a lot of vitals. I know how much well, your blood pressure is. I don't have good information on comorbidities in these data. I don't know, I'm looking at sudden cardiac death, but I don't know who has an implant device. I don't know information that may be more related to long-term pieces of health. What I know is about your near-term risk. And to me, that's one of the take-home messages around e e EHR data, is that you're capturing these really dynamic pieces of information that are most likely going to be most useful for near-term work. And, and actually, one of the th um, things that, that we're just wrapping up right now is, 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 d is dividing all, I think it's about 170 different predictive variables into sets of information, um, comorbidities, medications, labs, vitals, and just asking the question, what's their predictability over different time horizons? And showing that vitals are really good for seven-day risk, but really awful for three-year risk. Not surprising, but it's something you start thinking about, OK, what's the data that I have, and what can I do with it? Um, Highlighting that story, if we look at what the top predictor variables are, um, when we look at our near-term models, it's things like blood pressure, um, MAP, these really dynamic vitals. Um, when we look at one 180-day risk and one-year risk and one-year prediction, age comes up there, the, the medication dose you're receiving, which is much more stable. We see, a, we see a changing of that list of what the most important variables are. Um, to end on a maybe a slightly, though, negative note, because I think, but, but, but important, is this useful? So compared to something like, like Framingham, you, you get a C statistic of about 0.75 is depending on the cohorts you're looking at. We do 0.8. I mean, we were doing well. The event rate in Framingham if, uh, of CVD in the next 10 years is about 7.5%. In our data, it's about 1 in 10,000. I would say that any prediction paper, particularly when you're dealing with, with anything that has a degree of rarity, has to report the positive predictive value. Pe C statistics are great because they're invariant to the, prob to the event rate. So you can compare across different events. But because of that, they obscure clinical utility. The positive predictive value, meaning the probability that I call somebody an event who actually has the event, with the framing of risk, was about 35%. So 35% of the time that I say somebody's going to have an event, is going to have CVD in the next 10 years, they will actually get it. That's maybe not bad. I can improve my predictability by eightfold, from one in 10,000 by chance to eight in 10,000. Is there any clinician that's going to make a, a decision based on the fact that I said, this person's going to have a sudden cardiac death in 48 hours, and I'll be right eight in 10,000 times? <laughs> I hope not. Yeah. So there's a, 
And so I think this is actually the biggest challenge going forward when you think about near-term risk prediction is this rare event problem. I don't know if it's answerable. I'm inclined to think it's probably not answerable. Um, so I think there's going to be ways that we're going to have to, to, to work around. We're going to have to think about things like clinical utility um, and, making, and, and not saying this is an answer, but this is part of that clinical decision-making process. Um, just to um, wrap up with the, what I guess I say the take-homes, um, big data is, uh, for me is big opportunities, and big opportunities, as I like to say, to go small. Um, and as a methodology, it allows you to do a lot of fun things. You, you, can, you can optimally select a sample. You don't have to be constrained by what you have. You can go about validating your results. You don't have to say, I only, I, you, you don't, if you have 100,000 observations, don't analyze all 100,000, put some out, but you could, you know, get some true inference out of your results. Um, and from a methodological perspective, um, what I love about it is it allows you just to, to play with a lot of different me methods. I, you know, people often ask me, what methods do I work on? And my answer is I, I talk about the data I work with. And for me, it's about learning a set of data, learning something to play with, and then, and, and then being able to go in a lot of different directions with it. Um, and as of course, this is very collaborative work. Um, I don't do anything with, without anybody else. Um, and these are all wonderful people um, who have been working with me at, at different stages. Um, and then obviously people who, who pay my salary. <laughs>